Hello, and welcome to the Providence College Podcast. I'm your host, Liz Kay, and I'm joined by producer Chris Judge of the class of 2005. Here on the Providence College Podcast, we bring you interesting stories from the Fryer family. This week, we're talking with Dr. Wanda Ingram, the Senior Associate Dean for Undergraduate Studies, the freshman and sophomore class dean, and co-chair of the MLK Convocation Committee. This is a special year to talk with Dr. Ingram as we are celebrating the 50th anniversary of women enrolling as undergrads. Dr. Ingram was a member of the inaugural class to include women in 1971. Dr. Ingram, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Well, Providence College was definitely undergoing some changes when you joined the community in 1971. Can you tell us um, what led you to, to come to Providence College? What led you to choose to be part of that, um, that innovative pioneering class of women? I was going to be a science major and, and was. I am from, I'm a military brat and in Newport, I would say the majority of male teachers that I had in my high school, Rogers, were all graduates of Providence College, it seemed like. And the school was about to go co-ed and uh, it was strongly recommended by just about everybody <laughs> in the city that I go ahead and apply to that institution. Although I, was, I had my heart set on a couple of other places at first, but when I came to visit the institution and I kept hearing, well, this is the first year of women, but this is what we're planning on doing. This is what we're looking for. This is what we're striving for. Uh, we want you to be one of those individuals that makes a difference and, and makes a change. Uh, it, it, it caught me. And I, I realized, okay, let, let me go ahead, even though there were what, maybe 270 women and a good 2000 plus males that were on the campus, I mean, that's something that some people would say would be also good information as well <laughs> from that perspective. But in reference to just the challenges that were there, I was very happy with the fact that being a chemistry major and they had master's and doctoral uh, degrees in reference to it, I, I felt, okay, you know what, if I do well in this particular major, I can go far with regards to it. So it just, it just checked off all the right boxes at the time. So you were a chemistry major and there were graduate and doctoral students, but how many of the students um, in the sciences were women? Uh, two of us. <laughs> so, so two of 200, almost uh, 300 students. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, everybody knew where you were in the building. Nope, no problem there. I never felt unsafe. You always had the chivalry that was going on all the time with folks looking out for you, which was great too. So as being a novelty as it was. And then as a, as a woman, a black woman uh, in an institution like this, where there were very few of us, there were like, I think maybe 12 women total out of that group that came that first year with us. Uh, it, there were some transitions that occurred up for obvious reasons, just after the civil rights movements and et cetera, et cetera. But uh, there were a lot of teaching moments, let's put it that way. So let's dig into this a little bit more, please. There were about 280 women that enrolled that first year um, and only 12 of them were women of color. Um, how did the college help you with that transition to college life? Well, we started off with us coming in the summer prior to school beginning. And to be honest with you, with, with Father Morris and, and Dr. McKay, who were running the program itself for the Martin Luther King Scholarship Program, which is what that was part of, I was quite insulted at first because I kept thinking, well, uh, I'm, I'm I'm really all straight A student. Why, why do I need to come? Because I'm thinking of it as being remedial work with regards to my academics, not realizing that there's a whole process that one goes through with regards to just, you know, relating to an institution from other ways. So it turned out to be one of the best things that could have possibly happened. We developed a sense of community. Uh, we got to know people on campus and off campus, not only, you know, folks of color, because the majority of us were African-Americans at that time, but just to feel connected as a part of a strong community. Because remember, we didn't have cell phones and, and, and the media and whatever to be able to make connections with one another in social media, et cetera. So you needed to make those connections one on one. And it gave us an opportunity to do that during the summer so that by the time school started, we realized there were a lot of students that felt uh, you know, that they were really at a disadvantage because they didn't know anyone, they didn't know their way around. And here we are actually feeling like the experts in reference to being able to show folks where to go, who to see, how to talk with different individuals, et cetera. So it really did help us to, to make that transition a lot better. So you mentioned Father Morris and, and Dr. Dr. McKay, could you tell us more about them and some of the other people who helped you succeed at PC? 
Well, those were the two that uh, even when I came to visit in the, uh, before even school began and I was looking at different colleges, those were the two that convinced me that this was a good place to come. Father Morris, of course, uh, the, he had a handshake that would break your hand, but other than that, <laughs> he was kind of, uh, we all kind of considered him our adopted father because he, he knew and, and was aware of everything. If we had problems or questions or whatever, we would always find our way to him. Dr. McKay, who was my other mentor, he was a chemistry professor on top of it, even though I did not have him for class, but he was always there and, and convinced me to serve on the MLK uh, scholarship committee as a student representative as well. So he helped me with all of my different leadership types of skills. And what I learned, Father Morris was just there for everybody in reference to he was considered our adopted father. And Father Morris and Dr. McKay were two of the four people who really got the MLK scholarship program yes. going. Yes. Um, that have been honored as Vision Award recipients themselves, mm -hmm. um, which is which is phenomenal. Do you have any? I'm curious how you feel about if if MLK Day or if you reflect on this connection. I mean, it was there. They were inspired by Dr. King, so inspired by Dr. King to start this program at Providence College. I feel like there's got to be a connection there for you, or a special way to um, remember Dr. King. If it were not for that scholarship program, would you have come to Providence College? Probably not. Probably not. And it's funny that you asked me that question. I never really had thought of it that way, but the, the answer came out quick enough. Yeah. <laughs> so what brought you back to Providence College many years later? It's the 75th anniversary committee. I served on that one because Father Quigley, who uh, was our chaplain back then, so he was another one that was very close to um, our population of, of students while I was a student here. Uh, he convinced me to at least think about the possibility of coming back to PC. I was uh, working and I mean, commuting to Massachusetts, living in Rhode Island, I had a, a young family, baby, and he, he just said all the right things and, and kept talking about, well, we don't have a real academic dean for freshman students. And I understand you, you all of your work is about that whole aspect of transitions as a therapist, as one who oversees uh, student organizations and so on and so forth. Uh, would you be interested in this position that we're, we're developing? And I said, what does it look like? And next thing I know, we're having conversations about what it should look like. And now I'm realizing, okay, I think I'm helping to write my own job description here. But needless to say, came in, applied for it, and, uh, interviewed Dr. McKay and all the other individuals I already knew, among others, and realized it was going to be a good fit. There was plenty to be done here. And I'm sure that a job has evolved considerably yes, it has. <laughs> <It's> ballooned. <laughs> ballooned is probably the best way to describe it. Um, so if you're just thinking about your own work in the last two years, um, you've been doing this work since you arrived and forgive me at when, when did you arrive at return to Providence college? 1990. Mm -hmm. so it's been a minute. Yes. It's been a, minute. <laughs> a while. I said I'd be here maybe about five years. I lied. <laughs> You know, we, we were talking um, about how your job has evolved and ballooned, but I'm sure these last two years particularly have been challenged being the understatement, of course. Um, how has your work helping first year students and their families get adjusted to college life changed as a result of the pandemic? What were some of the biggest challenges and what have been some of the, it couldn't all have been bad. Were there any things that... Uh, you think going forward, you might change for the, for the, that might change for the better? Because it's, it's still evolving. It's kind of a hard question to answer right now. I mean, I think we're kind of making this up as we go along. Folks had said when the pandemic hit that uh, to come up with the vaccine in this shorter turnaround time was virtually impossible. And yet here we are, and we're talking about boosters and, and understanding how that particular you know, virus has evolved even again. So I, I see us as a work in progress. There's a lot of things that we haven't really realized yet in reference to the fallout from what students have gone through being sequestered during high school and then being sequestered while being here on the campus. Uh, the, the whole aspect of becoming a, a, a community is a little bit different because I think that with cell phones and, and being up on social media and the whole digital identity, that it's a different kind of animal than what I was accustomed to when I arrived at college. 
And uh, we're not quite sure, at least when, as, as I teach in student development theory in, at the graduate level and I speak with my students, we're not quite sure yet exactly what the it is that we're going to have to kind of work on because it is still definitely evolving. It's because it's not over yet. Yeah, everything is still in flux. It's still in flux and the lack of control, I think for everybody, I think it's getting to even the adults and the grown ups, the old folks as well, including yours truly, in reference to trying to cope with because there's so much beyond our control. It just makes you uncomfortable. And trying to explain that to students when we don't have the answers for ourselves, not always, it's not always easy. In 2001, you and your colleague, Jackie McKay, published a guide for families called Let the Journey Begin, a parent's guide, monthly guide for, to the college experience. Um, what are some of the, the bits of advice that you shared in that book that you feel remain true today for today's families? Well, having families understand that there is a process that students go through and that they can't solve everything for their, their sons and daughters, um, I think has always been that common message that still rings true. And uh, even with COVID and even with um, our, our parents that are trying to trying to plow the road a little bit more in reference to, the, I, I think of them sometimes as the snow plows because they're trying to clear all the snow and ice off the ground before their child walks through. And that's not necessarily gonna be the thing that's gonna help them benefit the most from this growth and, and, and the whole process. Uh, sometimes you have to kind of slip and slide a little bit. And that was the case back then when we wrote the book and it's still the case right now. It's just more biblical proportions, I would say, in reference to some of the things that they're trying to cope with. But it's still, I mean, I think it's pretty much pretty consistent. But as uh, the parents are, are not quite sure how best to deal with these kinds of things right now, even for themselves. So I, I tell parents, be as honest as you possibly can. Uh, don't speak for Johnny or Susie or whomever. Um, let them talk and we'll try to work on it together and we'll pull you in. But we need to first and foremost have those kinds of difficult conversations and dialogues with your child and then help them kind of figure it out and they can bounce those kinds of things off of you. And that's part of the whole value system that I think we have to kind of reinforce with the parents too. That the parents are support, but not yes. they're not speaking on behalf of their children. Exactly. Yeah. And with COVID and whatever, I found that uh, parents were kind of getting back to that. Well, um, I'm, and I will ask, well, where's Johnny or where's Susie or Amanda who, or whomever it is? Well, they're, they're busy right now. Well, I'm glad they're busy, but uh, we need, I need to have that conversation with the student and we can talk with you afterwards, but we need to have that conversation together because yeah, it, and it's, it's getting back to even 9-11 once again, which I think kind of started a lot of this in reference to protecting your child. And as a parent and a grandparent, I understand that fully, but we have to allow them to, to grow. And the only way that that's gonna happen is with some, some challenges in development. But each one of those challenges is practice for when they mm -hmm. go off to be you know, full grown mm -hmm. adults themselves one day, right? Right, exactly. And you're not always gonna have all the right answers and that's, we'll be fine with that. It's gonna take some time. So Wanda, before you, I let you go, I can't resist asking you about your creative side. Um, I'm sure many people, many alumni have come through your office and had, may not have even known um, about all the work you do on your own. And I'm, I'm hoping that you can tell us how um, that helped you through the pandemic as well. Can you tell us about some of your creative endeavors? I have an art background. And originally, when I started talking about college, I was thinking about going to art school instead of a regular liberal arts institution or a science institution as well, even though I could do the chemistry and, and whatever, um, I've always done artwork as well. But my mother, I think, made it very clear, and she was absolutely right, as, especially as a military wife where, you know, they're just, just the facts, ma'am, kind of, kind of way of, of raising your child as well. Uh, you only like to do your artwork when you want to do it. So you're probably not going to eat a whole lot because you're not going to get uh, you're not going to get paid because there are certain times when you don't want to do anything artistic at all. And she was absolutely right. So I tell my students all the time, we have a lot of abilities, but some things we're going to find that they're going to go down the path of being extracurriculars instead. And that's fine because that's what keeps you, keeps you level. 
in reference to dealing with all the other negative things at times. And I'm a perfect example of that. I mean, I do a little bit of this and that all the time. I, I do a lot of sewing. I've made many costumes for my granddaughter and anyone who walks in my office will see all of the different outfits that she's, I mean, Disney has nothing on me in reference to some of the things that I have been able to make and it's wonderful. Um, I make a lot of jewelry. I, a lot of folks are wearing a lot of the things that I have made. I make a lot of cards, especially pop-up cards, because the, the science of physics and how they pop up, the angles, I'm fascinated by that. So I make a lot of three-dimensional types of cards. I do a lot of glass etching. I do a lot of wood burning. So those are the kinds of things that have really kept me level in reference to just coping with things and watching less TV and doing more artistic activities. I have a studio in my house, which has moved from not one bedroom, but now two. So <laughs> it has started to take over. <laughs> but uh, but it, I'm glad to hear that your passions have so much real estate in your home. That's oh, yes, they do. <laughs> um, one, it's been wonderful chatting with you today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your patience and your time. You take care. Subscribe to the Providence College podcast in all the usual places, including iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify, as well as your smart speaker. If you like what you hear, please review and share with others. Thanks for listening and go Friars.